So, Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Julia Broder, Brody, who is the executive director of the Silent Spring Institute, which is very apropos in light of our comments about um, Silent Spring that you heard from Jay. Um, she's done lots of important things, but one of the most interesting is that since 1996, she has been the principal investigator on the Cape Cod Breast Cancer and Environment Study, a case control study of 2,100 women that includes testing for 89 endocrine disruptors in homes and doing historical exposure uh, mapping. Uh, Dr. Brody is an, uh, an adjunct assistant professor at the Brown University School of Medicine. Uh, I mentioned in my talk, breast cancer is one of our conclusions, and I think she'll give us a good bit more input at this time. Thanks for being here. I'm going to start talking while they work on my slides. It's, it's uh, great, great to be here. Um, you guys do an awful lot of wonderful work in the world, and I have some new assignments for you. Um, there's been a great deal of misinformation about pesticides and breast cancer, and so I'm counting on you to help straighten it all out um, and look forward to further conversation about this in the workshop. And I also am delighted that my board member, Ellie Goldberg, is here, and uh, Silent Spring Institute's dear friends in Green Cape, uh, uh, on Cape Cod, and so it's really, really wonderful to be connected to this group through their wonderful work as well. Okay, so obviously Silent Spring Institute was named in tribute to Rachel Carson, and it's, it's also wonderful to be here on this year, or the 50th anniversary of the publication of Silent Spring. Many people don't realize that she died of breast cancer just two years after the book was published. So it's especially extraordinary to read her words when she says, for those in whom cancer is a known or unknown presence, treatment must, of course, continue. But, for the gener but certainly for the generations yet unborn, prevention is the imperative need. So she, she was a tremendous inspiration in so many ways. So I have five things I want to tell you about pesticides and breast cancer, and this first one is often where people begin and end in talking about breast cancer and pesticides. So we, we, we do know that organic chlorine pesticide residues measured in women's blood late in life are not associated with breast cancer diagnosis. Anybody here from Long Island? So the Long Island study put the nail into this one. This is... Uh, but unfortunately, AP reported this no pollution breast cancer link, a little broadly generalized there. This is really just a slight, tiny slice of knowledge about what we know, um, and there's so much that we don't know about this and, and probably can't know. So here's the basic study design. We heard, we heard the DDT story. So DDT came into use in the U.S. in 1945 peaked in 1959, peaked in food around 65, banned in 72, and then most studies, nearly all studies, measured DDE in uh, women who had been diagnosed with breast cancer and others of similar age in the 1990s and found no association with breast cancer diagnosis. So uh, this is where we get that number one thing we know about breast cancer and pesticides. But we don't know, uh, DD, DDE is a breakdown product or metabolite of DDT. It's an anti-androgen. DDT is an estrogen. We know that estrogen causes breast cancer. DDE isn't the, toxicologically the same. So we're hoping that DDE is a proxy for exposure years ago before breast cancer was diagnosed. But we don't really know that. And Suzanne Snedeker has made a strong argument for why that might not be a good assumption. So uh, on the Komen website, you'll see first a statement that, that organic chlorine pesticides are not probably not associated with breast cancer, which, as I said, is, is over, oops, over generalized. And you'll also see, well, if, if, if pesticides cause breast cancer, we would see that in farmers. So let's think about that. Is that true? There are not that many wind farmers. There were not that many wind farmers 60 years ago when breast cancer is diagnosed today, may have started. 
we do know that women pesticide applicators who don't use protective gear do have breast cancer rates that are higher than uh, others. Um, and we also do know that uh, farm women and rural women have some other characteristics that differ. They have more physical activity, they have less exposure to some things, more exposure to other things, maybe less use of uh, hormone replacement therapy, which was adopted more in urban settings. So there are lots of things that differs, differ between farm women and other women that may complicate this picture and make it hard to uh, uh, draw this conclusion that you see on the Komen website. So here's a, a, a different study done in California that had access to a unique resource. So you remember this DDT story and the usual studies uh, out here collected blood in the 1990s after DDT had been banned and the women were adults. So Barbara Cohn had access to blood drawn in women who gave birth in the Kaiser system in the Bay Area in San Francisco in 1959 to 1967. So these are, are young women um, during the years of DDT use, and uh, they were followed uh, through the 1990s for breast cancers diagnosed later. So this study, first of all, it has exposures to real DDT, not anything else. I mean, not, yeah, sure, everyone, they're exposed to other things, but it's not primarily a study of DDE. And here's what they found. Uh, 129 of the women in the study had been diagnosed with breast cancer by the time they were 50. And a five-fold increase in those with the highest blood levels in their 20s of DDT, who, and among those who were younger than 14 at the time of their exposure. So we have a natural experiment. Dr. Wargo alluded to this earlier, where we just expose everybody. But we have a natural experiment that we know when DDT went into use, so that people born before that do not have any prenatal exposures to it. Um, so, and uh, the study also found no association with DDE, so it's just completely consistent with all those other studies. So um, it's been discussed already that there's, there may be, this, this study may be part of the picture that's emerging about the science uh, showing that early life exposures may affect people differently than exposures later in life and may be more worrisome. So the breast actually is not fully developed until the end of the first full-term pregnancy. And we think that it may be particularly vulnerable before birth um, during puberty and during that first pregnancy. Some of the chemicals that have been studied in animal models um, showing these effects are dioxins, the plastic uh, plasticizer BPA, the pesticide atrazine, and the non-stick uh, surface uh, chemicals, perfluorinated compounds. And there's a fact sheet in your packet uh, of a review by my colleague Ruth Ann Rudell about these compounds. So why don't we know more from human studies? So uh, it was mentioned already, we don't have any controls and we, we don't do uh, experiments except this expose everybody type of experiment on pollutants in people. Um, so we don't have any controls. Most of the studies are not looking at early exposure. We know that breast cancer is affected by exposures from before birth through the five years before diagnosis. So we need to cover that entire period in an exposure measurement strategy for a good breast cancer study. Um, and it's, it's, to measure exposure is expensive and difficult because we can't just ask people. Most of what we know about breast cancer comes from questions that you can just call people up on the phone and say, when was your first kid born? And did you use hormone replacement therapy? Um, and most chemicals have never been included in any breast cancer study, either in animals or in humans. So um, we need a new evidence strategy. You will see in October, you will hear somebody say there's no proof that such and such causes breast cancer. And um, these limitations in human studies are, are an indication that we need a different strategy for deciding when we're going to act. 
And uh, so Silent Spring Institute's research program is based on uh, a strength of evidence approach that says if there's biological evidence that a chemical has, has biological activity that we think makes, might link it to breast cancer, and we know that lots of people are exposed to that chemical, then we have a basis for action to educate, to regulate, to reformulate products. Okay, number three. Um, many chemicals, including pesticides, do have biological activity that makes us think they may be linked to breast cancer. So there are uh, three types of chemicals that we're particularly interested in, those that are breast carcinogens, they damage DNA. In the US, a pesticide that showed strong evidence of being a breast can uh, carcinogen wouldn't get licensed, so that's a good start. Um, but we are exposed to many breast carcinogens in air pollution and products. Second, endocrine disruptors, so chemicals that might make a tumor grow, and pesticide, many pesticides do fall into this class. So these chemicals are actually identified by testing in human breast cancer cells, and they can make breast cancer cells uh, grow. Third, uh, some of these endocrine disruptors affect development, and we've already heard a little bit about that, uh, with DES being the model. Here's uh, an example of uh, atrazine. I don't know if there are any pathologists in the crowd, but even if you're not, oops, oops, I went the wrong way there. Um, these are control animals, and these were exposed uh, both prenatally and through their mom's milk. And you can see that this, the structures are kind of stunted over here. There's a lot going on here, not much here. And the, uh, the breast structures haven't really uh, grown together the way they have here. These are, the mil these are the milk ducts. And here in their later stage of development, they have these globule type of ends that um, make, this, make the younger animal permanently more susceptible to carcinogens, breast carcinogens. OK, number four, we are exposed. Um, we're less exposed through food than we used to be, but as has been mentioned, we're using these pesticides in our homes and they, they, ex they persist for a long time. Silent Spring Institute has tested for them uh, in, in 170 homes in Massachusetts and California. We found 27 different pesticides in homes, uh, 16 of them in air. So if, if they're more likely to be in dust, um, which exposes our babies and toddlers, but they're also in air, which exposes all of us. We found DDT in two-thirds of the homes we've tested, chloridane in more than half. We found orthophenolphenol in 100% of the air samples that we tested. Uh, I'll, I'll, hmm. Uh, I'll leave this for later since we're running out of time. And don't stress about this. It's a brand new paper. So industry's mantra is, yeah, yeah, it's there, but it's not enough to hurt you. Um, but this new study has uh, used high-throughput chemical testing methods to screen a large number of chemicals to see at what concentration they have biological activity that's of concern. And then they looked at the National Exposure Report levels of exposure in people. And this is the list of pesticides for which the exposure in people today in the US exceeds the concentration at which these uh, pesticides were biologically active in this test system. So um, the President's Cancer Panel has um, I, I mentioned earlier that Silent Spring Institute's research is moving towards a new model of what, we, what kinds of evidence we seek before we take action. The President's Cancer Panel has underlined this, saying we need action based on compelling animal and in vitro evidence before cause and effect in humans has been, in, been proven. I just remind everybody that for breast cancer, there are more than 200,000 diagnoses a year so that if these preventable causes are linked to even a small fraction of these breast cancers, 
removing those exposures would change the lives of thousands of women and their families. Um, I also hope you'll come visit us electronically at silentspring.org. We published a big paper a couple weeks ago about hormone disruptors and consumer products. If you're an NPR listener, you might have heard, heard us on, on point. Um, and so hope you'll hope you'll check it out. Thanks, everyone.